Hello everyone, my name is Jim Colossi with Core Shop Solutions and welcome to today's webinar on when only 1% of your traffic converts with speaker Bryce Macbeth. Now this webinar is sponsored by Core Shop Solutions, uh, the PIM and web to print experts, Rackspace, which is hosting for the ultimate website performance and scalability, Stone Commerce, Data uh, Matanonized, and Reap Marketing, obsessive about conversion rate optimization. Now our speaker today is Bryce Macbeth of Reek Marketing and he wrote the book on conversion rate optimization. As a conversion rate coach and author, Bryce is uniquely qualified to help and avoid the mistakes that cripple your website's conversions. Now in this webinar, you'll learn how to run A-B experiments to maximize conversion. And you'll also learn why it matters to be accessible and transparent and how to stop hurting conversion by mistaken social media efforts. So uh, you're all muted, uh, so ask any questions in the chat box. So with that, Bryce, tell us how to increase our online sales. <laughs> okay, Jim, well, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, cool, well, this is, uh, thanks for having me, number one, but this is a topic I'm definitely very passionate about, is things that we covertly, sometimes inadvertently and frequently, unknowingly do to turn business away from our website. It's, uh, it's kind of like astronomy. <laughs> We are collecting sort of limited and uh, light data sometimes to develop a hypothesis that then you have to continue to disprove your way to a more accurate theory. Uh, in our case with uh, websites, the process called conversion rate optimization, which is just things that you can do to explore uh, doing better with the traffic that you already have on your website. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, I'm just going to jump straight into the content since we only have 30 minutes today and keep uh, keep an eye on the time and get you back to the rest of your day. But uh, the first one, straight straightforward and, and bluntly, is a lot of times websites, especially e-commerce sites, can be overly social. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. This is a screenshot of the Shopify website. Um, most e-commerce sites at some point, you know, especially the small and medium business sector, um, you know, looks at Shopify and considers launching a Shopify website or moving their site to Shopify because that has this lure of it being such an easy to use website and easy to maintain and easy to plug in and uh, plug and play a bunch of different apps and plugins that help you increase uh, your conversions or whatnot. Uh, the, the issue with even uh, Shopify, and you, you just example what I mean by being overly social, you notice on this web page at the bottom near the footer, there is a list of uh, about eight different social media icons. And all of us in marketing tend to, you know, want to overgeneralize in terms of, um, you know, people want access to us and, and, you know, where our social media is. And social media is an important part of marketing, which it, I'm not here to argue that uh, whatsoever. I understand that. Uh, it is valuable. Uh, but in this case where you're providing links on the homepage where, you know, many people are starting their sessions, uh, there is a, you know, in this case, if somebody were to actually click this Facebook link on Shopify, which I did, uh, I went over to Facebook and before you know it, after surfing a few, you know, cat videos and um, checking in to see, you know, what uh, my mom had for breakfast or something, uh, all of a sudden I'm being presented uh, ads targeted to me because they know that I own an online store uh, for this other shopping cart software called 3D Cart. So if I was compelled to click on this ad and sign up for an account, then uh, Shopify basically would have paid for me to, buy, to, to, uh, on, to enroll on their competitor's website. And as you guys know, it's really hard when you want your on the e-commerce platform, there's certainly ways to get off of a platform and onto a better one like, you know, PIMCOR. Um, but uh, when you lose somebody at the beginning of the process, sometimes it's really hard to convince them to stop what they're doing, get off of that platform and get onto yours. So in this case, I really think some, a company like Shopify has shot themselves in the foot and it's not too uncommon uh, for other companies to do the same exact thing. It's not just uh, the e-commerce industry. Here's a client who came to us recently and asked us to do a quick assessment. Behold, uh, they, uh, they're not working with us, but they're still making some of the same mistakes. So you go to Taco Diner, there's these massive high contrast call to action, connect with us on Facebook, right? So if you notice that link, it's hard not to. Uh, you click it, 
and you're off to Facebook and next thing you know, you're confronted with other <laughs> Mexican food restaurants that uh, arguably are as good as, if not better than a uh, taco diner. Um, so even if it's not uh, a competing restaurant, you could find you know, friends who are grilling out at home. Uh, maybe now I have a, you know, a more conscious about the, you know, what I should be eating or whatnot. And now I'm not even interested in Mexican food anymore. Um, but the point is, is you can easily shoot yourself in the foot by trying to facilitate people getting to your social media instead of looking at your social media as a way to generate new interest and awareness and driving people to your website. Once you have them on your website, it can work uh, counterintuitive and sort of counter against your efforts by sending them back to social media because social media can be very competitive waters. There is one example, I'm not gonna get too far into this now because it's really more, usually more in a B2B type scenario, but uh, there is a case for some social media. In this case, what I'd say is, you know, the use of LinkedIn um, as part of the contact strategy for a lot of B2B websites will uh, really kind of help open up and allow you to see who is viewing your profile. In this case, when I link to pe uh, people to uh, my LinkedIn profile, I'm able to see who's looking at my profile. In this case, I've got the uh, vice president of marketing at Freebirds World Burrito, uh, the director of online ROI and marketing and web optimization at Ace Cash Express, and investor and CEO of livingdirect.com. All of those seem like perfect candidates uh, for hiring me for what I do to help them increase their conversions on their websites. So again, I've got you know ways that I go about reaching out to them and scripts and stuff. That's beyond the scope of what we're trying to get in today, especially if we're trying to keep things on time. Uh, but the whole point here with e-commerce is you really don't want to intentionally drive users to competitive waters. You want to kind of keep them on your website once they're there, make it more of a one-way valve, use social media to generate interest and keep uh, existing fans engaged and drive people to your website, not away from it. And then the one exception may be to drive uh, subject matter expert LinkedIn profiles if you have a LinkedIn sales navigator account and the purpose of what you're trying to do is generate business leads. how I look at these scenarios when I'm evaluating a website and do an assessment or an audit on a website to figure out where the conversion opportunities lie. It's important for you to understand how I look at a typical website. I look at a typical website, you know, especially an e-commerce store is really a lot easier to do this, but um, not to unlike a department store on Black Friday. So if you imagine a department store on Black Friday and if the store is successful in their advertising efforts, they have a thousand people lined up outside the door and wrapped around the corner waiting for the doors to open at 4 a.m. Once the doors open, some of those thousand people have actually stuck around and waited for the doors to open. Some, some of the other ones have actually decided to go to another sale or another store. Um, somebody else had called them and told them that they're waiting at a different store and they want to meet up. So you've lost some of those thousand people before the doors even open. And then by the time people actually get into the store, only some of them will find the product that they came looking for. And only some of those people, once they find the product, will decide to pick the item up, maybe look at the price, uh, read the label, uh, do a price comparison against what they find on Amazon, and, uh, and do, do that type of assessment. Only some of those people who look at those details will actually put that item in their cart. Once having done that, only some of those people who put their item in the cart will make it to the checkout, pay for the item, put it in a car, and not bring it back. So if only 10 people on, uh, let's say Black Friday at a department store uh, purchased out of 1,000 people, somebody would be fired. But it, only, it really represents a 1% conversion rate. You only converted 1% of the original 1,000 people who came with the intent to buy who actually bought something. That 1% is how the average website converts traffic into visitors. So somehow we don't allow that in a department store, but we do allow it to happen on our websites. So if you looked at this uh, image closely and can sort, sort of looked at more like a area chart, you'll notice that there's a screen sliver at the bottom uh, of the graph. That represents the one to 2% that your website might convert traffic at. The rest of the people are the 99% of the people who come to your website with an intent and leave without doing anything. 
as marketers, we obsess over getting more and more of these people who do convert, uh, which is really the holy grail of you know, marketing is getting the perfect cus customers to your website actually doing something. Where my agency focuses on this other 99%. There is 99 times the amount of opportunity on most websites already on the website rather than having to go outside the website and promote the site even more. So it's a lot less expensive to work with the resources you already have rather than having to spend more money to drive, the, drive more traffic. One of the ways that we do this and, and tap into that other 99% is through a process called A-B split testing. And some of you may already know this and I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence uh, by any means. But A-B split test basically means you split the audience in half and some of the visitors will see one version of the web page and the rest of the people will see a different version of the web page. That version can be a different picture, could be a different copy, could be a different logo, different navigation elements, different offer, can be anything. Any theory that you have that might get more people to do something uh, makes up for a good A-B test. So you may or may not notice the difference in these two screenshots here. If you think about it, there's really no other option. You either notice it or you don't. Um, and you may develop a theory over which one of these two versions actually sells more cheesecake at Magianos. Uh, if you're interested, I'll tell you more about that here in a little bit, uh, if and when we have time towards the end of the, the presentation. Uh, but keep that in mind. This is a screenshot of my original website. I actually uh, also own an e-commerce business of my own, so I've been in your shoes and uh, I created the first um, e-commerce store that sold salon furniture and disrupted the industry. Uh, there are four times as many salons in the United States than are gas stations, if you can believe that. And we disrupted the industry, uh, introduced uh, e-commerce to the salon and beauty industry and created the, the world's uh, first um, uh, salon uh, e-commerce business and optimize our own conversion rates by over 950% through the means of testing and the techniques that I'm talking about today. So that website is called Standish Salon Goods and we wrote about our experience in setting up our own business and optimizing our own conversions in a book called Salon Shares Don't Sell Themselves. You can get a copy of that book if you go to priceofbeth.com slash coreshop99 that's where you can also get a copy of today's slide so you don't have to take a bunch of screenshots. You're welcome to uh, if you want to, uh, but you can also just download the slides uh, from this page at pricebeth.com slash core shop. Um, and then you can uh, also see the, any other upcoming events. And I think there's some links on there to sch schedule an assessment uh, or a consultation with us. So let's get on to the, the next uh, topic here or the next takeaway is having a week about us page. So does your about page uh, prevent you from selling more product? Let me give you a, a story about our own website again. Um, we noticed a strong correlation between the people who checked out on our website with the people who actually viewed the about us section. We dug into it a little bit more and we found that the people who looked at the about us page has a five times higher conversion rate than the average visitor. Uh, and when they do check out, they have 151% higher average order value. Uh, so we have spent a lot of time, not just on our product pages and price matching, but also telling our story of who we are and why we exist. Um, for the longest time we had, we hit our members because we really didn't want to be discovered by the industry. We just really wanted to sell product to the end user we really did not want industry recognition because we kind of wanted to fly under the radar. But once armed with this information, we made it a priority and really built out our about us content. And even our latest version of our homepage really kind of embrace more of what it is that we do that's unlike any other website in the industry. In this case, there's this caption front and center that says, we're the only website that blends quality made items in the US and affordable import professional equipment to achieve the perfect look without breaking the bank. There's a video there, not just from me, but from our employees who are speaking about their passion in working for the company and also our client's passion in working with us to achieve the look that they're looking for. So I'm not the only one. We had a client called Letter Jacket who sells customized envelopes. And the site's just to uh, make a long story short, the site is extremely difficult to use. Um, you know, some, a lot of times, high degree of customization can make things complex. And that was certainly the case with their website. 
So we had the daunting task of reconfiguring or redesigning the user interface uh, on the website to get more people to use the wizard and to check out. So we didn't really even know where to start. And if we got it wrong, it could be a very expensive testing process to get it right. So uh, if you think in your mind, what would you do in the scenario where you don't really know where to start with, you know, redesigning the wizard? In our case, what we did, what we decided to do is we actually just updated the phone number. We just updated the header and put a big phone number in the top right. You may have noticed that I'm gonna toggle back again. Here's the first version with no phone number in the top right. And the second version there, with a phone number in the top right. So it seems like a pretty obvious change. Our theory was that we could generate a few phone calls, uh, help people with their order, put money in the bank, then ask them questions about their experience so that we could get closer to a right answer the next time we built the solution. The result is where the surprise comes in because the result is that we got actually zero increase in phone calls but our sales increased by over 400% and the amount of people clicking through from the homepage increased by over 400% when they're coming in from campaigns. So to me, what that tells me is uh, that, you know, people did really, our visitors really did understand what it is that we we're doing and why it was important and why they should continue uh, down the path. Uh, but it was daunting. And by putting the phone number in there that did a couple of things, it gave them the confidence in knowing they could call somebody if they ever needed some help. But the other thing it did was it made us more transparent. They knew that if they ran into an issue with their order, that they always knew that they could call somebody and pin somebody down and uh, either complain to somebody or get somebody's help to rectify the situation. So just by having a clear and transparent phone number makes us more, uh, more transparent, more accessible, and increases their confidence that we're the right pe uh, people to do business with. So I think um, this is a screenshot of Barrington Gifts uh, website, barringtongift.com. And uh, they have this amazing video. It's not the, the you know, sexiest designed about us video uh, or web page I think I've ever seen but the video itself is phenomenal. It tells the story of their company, how they resource their material, you know, when they do have, you know, factories in China, how they use those resources responsibly and what it means to their customers. So uh, a lot of information about their purpose and their why statement and really creating an element of exclusivity. What you get from BarringtonGift.com is unlike anything you will ever get from any other website. So they did a great job with that. Another sort of hidden uh, purpose behind having really good about us content is that Google really does like to show your about us uh, content or your story in the six pack of um, uh, links, of site links uh, in your search results. So you'll see here I searched for flip flops, one of the local companies here, Hardy Mari's based on right down the street from us. And um, just as an example, you'll notice this with other websites too. They'll, my, they might feature several different departments or categories that are featured on your website, but frequently they will also feature your company information in that six pack of site links. Um, so you wanna get it right, because it's being featured. Here's uh, Hari Mari's uh, About Us page. I recommend you go uh, check it out. Uh, they do a really good job of telling their story and why they exist and also creating that unique element of exclusivity. What you get from Hari Mari is unlike any other site you'll uh, ever go shop. So in summary, what you do about this. Um, so the solution to fi uh, fixing your week about us page is, you know, telling your story and, and being forthcoming with that and explain your why. There's a really good video from Simon Sinek called Start With The Why. Uh, if you have not seen that video, probably most of you have, but if you have not seen that video, I do recommend everybody go uh, do that as a homework assignment. It's called Starting With Why by Simon Sinek. I type that into YouTube and it will probably guess, you'll probably type in the letter S and it will probably guess Simon Sinek Starting With Why. Uh, it's a very popular video. Um, but, you know, I think also making what you do exclusive to you is what I call the stop people in their tracks moment where there's no sense in even going shopping on another website because they know that even Amazon can't offer what you offer on your website. Uh, and then having a reason if, if it's appropriate and you want people to contact you or enroll in your newsletter from your About Us page is having a reason for them to contact you. 
Uh, it's not uncommon for a lot of these smaller companies to provide contact information directly to the owner of the company or directly to a subject matter expert. And it works wonderfully well, even better a lot of times in the contact us page. Uh, and so if that's a goal of yours is to get people engaged because it creates some unique differentiation, then certainly by, by all means, leverage your about us page to get people uh, engaged with your staff, your support team, your sales team or whatnot. So the next thing is uh, not running A, B split tests. So are you designing by committee or designing based on a hunch, uh, which is very common. <laughs> Usually the highest paid person in the organization is the one that gets their way when it comes to the design of a website. It could be 10 people in a room and you have 10 to 20 ideas of how the site should be redesigned and ultimately the guy who gets paid the most or the, the woman who gets paid the most is the one who decides and puts a foot down and says, I think this is the way it's going to be. And that's the way it happens. So I recently visited uh, blinds.com in Houston, visited a uh, Brad Par parlor here featured um, to my right, uh, featured on the left there, but to my right, um, they have this uh, amazing philosophy of, about experimentation and says um, experiment without fear of, of failure. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, as you walk through their bullpen, uh, their analysts sit next to their designers and they have these two test tubes sitting in their bullpen. The one on the left has a bunch of marbles in it that represent all the A-B tests they've ever run that resulted in a failure, meaning that their new idea, their new design, their new copywriting actually worked worse than their previous version or the incumbent version. And then all the marbles in the right test tube represent a successful test, meaning they came up with an idea, they tried it on the website, they measured it, and statistically proved that it was a better version of the web page than the original. What you'll notice here is there's about twice as many failed tests as successful tests. Um, so in order for that to be to twice as much, that means that there's about a 66% failure rate, which is not just blinds.com number, not just my number, it is an industry number, in fact, 60 to 65% of all A-B tests result in a failure. So even though as marketers with infinite wisdom, we do things to get people's attention and impress people and create a good user experience, the fact is that most of them do not work as we intended them. Whether we had bad ideas or our visitors don't have good taste, whatever the reason is, they don't work. So if you're not doing A-B testing, at best, you are treading water. So the other thing I like about this visual here and what they do with these test tubes is you notice that Brad has this humongous smile on his face um, because uh, he likes the fact that these tests uh, result in a failure and he knows about it because if you know about it, knowing's half the battle, in this case, I'd say it's maybe even a little bit more than that, uh, but if you know what's not working, then you can stop it and you can roll it back to the original version. So they really embrace their failed test as successes. Um, so if you remember back, oops, sorry, if you remember back to the uh, A-B test I showed you in the beginning from Magianos, uh, the version on the left has a button that says view menu and the one on the right has a button that says make a reservation. Most people don't even notice what the difference in these two versions are. No visitor sees both. They only see one, so they don't even know, uh, they're not even aware of other options. So they're only acting based on what they see. And what we find is that when it says make a reservation, we actually get a pretty high increase in not only primary clicks, but almost a full percent increase in online reservations uh, from the dinner menu pages on Magianos.com. But if you guessed the wrong one and you weren't really sure, you know, which one won and you picked the one on the left, you would have gotten it wrong. You would have had a fail. You is it provides insurance for you. It allows you to identify when you went wrong and roll it back to the original version. If on the case, like with a uh, letter jacket, if you guessed this correctly and said, oh yeah, the new phone number is going to be great. Uh, it's going to be a winner, then you're right. But by running it as an A-B test here, you still are able to substantiate how much better the test is. So in my case, it was a 60% increase in sales. It's not just better, it's 60% better. 
And when you're, especially when you're testing something that could be expensive, like rolling out videos and making a video for every single product on your website, that could be an expensive undertaking. Wouldn't it be better to test it first and see exactly how much better that helps the conversion rates and then use that to build a business case for how much you should be spending on these videos. So if you're not already doing A-B testing, there's a lot of tools out there. There's only a, a, a handful listed here. These are some of the industry's top tools. Um, I don't recommend, even though Optimizely, I've listed Optimizely over the right because we're a certified partner of Optimizely, um, but they can be very, I'll admit, they can be very difficult to work with. And we've started using VWO or Visual Website Optimizer more, but anybody can get started with Google Optimize over here, down here in the top, uh, bottom left. Um, so ultimately it's not the tool that optimizes the website, it's the company and the partners that you work with. Uh, these are tools just to help facilitate these A-B tests that I'm talking about. So um, the, uh, I mentioned a while ago, like as far as getting started, now once you have the tool, if you're not already doing testing, um, you can test all these types of things like video. We find that uh, people are 400% more likely to watch a video than read the same exact content that's on the page. This is a screenshot of Zappos.com, by the way. They won't even launch a product unless a video is on the page because video is so compelling. So, uh, so 400% more likely to watch the video than read the same content. And after having watched the video, they're 65% more likely to buy. Here's another thing uh, that is, uh, really helps with conversions is product reviews, whether you've been overt about and intentional about going and getting more reviews or not, this can increase 50 to 255% uh, increase in conversion rate on these products that have more than 50 reviews. Just the mere presence of reviews can increase conversion rates by more than 50%, but by having 50 or more reviews can increase uh, the conversion rates by over 250%. Uh, I mentioned a while ago this case study with a phone number. In our case, uh, we got a uh, we can get 400% increase in conversions and 60% increase in sales, even without generating a single phone call. And then, you know, trying to find your unique edge and your why and why somebody should not go anywhere else to shop. Uh, in this case, you can argue whether or not this is a super strong, you know, exclusivity statement. But the point is, is if you can convince people that what you have is what they want and there's nowhere else to get it and they're willing to pay for it, then there's a 100% chance they're going to buy it from you. So uh, let's recap this. So uh, running a B test, the idea is to test it in order to best it. What works for some websites does not always work for everyone. So even though I told you you should, uh, that letter jacket put a big fat phone number in the top right of their, their uh, homepage, doesn't mean that you're going to get the same exact results. And there's a lot of cases we've found where we try to duplicate something from another website and it just didn't work as well. And sometimes it just failed. So without testing, you really don't know the final answer. Keep in mind that 65% of all ideas fail and without testing, you never really know which, you know, percent of which uh, items are the 35% of the ones that will improve the sales conversions. Uh, it's really important to embrace loss uh, uh, tests that lose as winning insights. So you found something that does not work and you're able to roll it back to the original example. And then cooler, sexier, cleaner, more white space, all these things that everybody's want. Nobody comes to an agency and asks for an ugly website, um, but it's not always the cleanest and most modern and most impressive looking website that has the highest conversion rate. In fact, in my case, uh, to make a long story short, we found that a better looking website exuded a sense of uh, lack of uh, obtainability that it made the product actually look more expensive and we had to actually dumb down the design a little bit uh, to make people feel like it was actually more affordable to them. So cooler, sexier, cleaner does not always mean higher conversion rates. So if you're asking for a cool website, you're asking for a beautiful website, something that's easier to navigate, be careful exactly how you word that and who you work with. So I think we're up against the 30 minutes here. Again, the call to action here. <laughs> uh, your homework assignment is to go to brycemithbeth.com slash core shop 99. Get a copy of the today's slides. Download the, the ebook. Uh, salon chairs don't sell themselves if you're interested. There's a list of upcoming events and you can schedule a quick assessment. We can take a look at your website if you want and give you uh, a couple additional tips of things that you can do to improve your own conversion. So. 
Uh, with that, Jim, I'll turn it back over to you, and thanks again for having me. Hey, thanks, Bryce. That was great. Learned a lot on this one, and uh, we do have some questions for you. And by the way, you ended up exactly on time. That was great. Uh, <laughs> you answered one of the questions already. Somebody asked which uh, uh, A-B testing system to use, so that was good. Uh, the next one, it says, uh, should we not promote our social media at all? Uh, says this seems to be the uh, fly in the face of everything else that we've heard. Yeah, yeah. So uh, some of the things I say is uh, you know to take a little bit of heat for. I have another um, uh, popular uh, presentation called "SE is a Hoax" that tends to pull people out of the woodwork and uh, start a lot of conversation. Um, but yeah, so I, you know I think my main message is you know try it. Like if if you don't know, you should test like hiding it or moving it or whatnot. I think certainly we found cases where you know, there's social media icons up right next to the cart icon. So right before somebody goes to check out, they're lured into potentially going and looking at a social media page. And that's just, you know, flat out bad, I think. Um, but, you know, whether you should you have it on there to build your audience or not, you know, my general theory and hypothesis is that you, know, you should uh, have, uh, if people are seeking you out by name and they, they are going intentionally to look for your product because they know about it, uh, and they're searching by brand name and they find your website or they're typing the, your website directly into the browser and you're in that scenario, it's okay to potentially include the social media icon so people know how to stay connected with you because it can be sort of an extension of your uh, email database by having more and more followers. But if you're in early stage or even middle stage and you're finding a lot of people are discovering you organically by looking at, at products in your industry that you sell, but they're, they're, there's no indication they under, they know you as a brand. You really might want to dial back a little bit on that because, like I said, sending people to social media uh, can be um, sending them to competitive water. So you just have to be careful about it. And like I said earlier, knowing's half the battle, and you should ultimately test it if you have any questions about it. Okay, we just have a couple more, and we'll let people get get on from here. And, and uh, this one's a good one. It says, "How can we get started with testing?" You showed some tools. What are the uh, some first steps to finding what to test? Yeah, so we, my company provides an audit to help sort of rank these in a number of different categories. Let me go back and show you. We talked about, um, yeah, yeah, this is a good one. So yeah, we talked about a couple of different things that you could test here. You know, ultimately, I kept driving at this point about, um, you know, trying to find your element of exclusivity, like how you can say to the masses that you have something that you that they can't find anywhere else that creates a stop stop them in their tracks moment. Um, so ultimately, that's good. All these things that increase the conversion rates by ten thousand percent or four hundred percent or two hundred fifty-five percent, those are really great places to start. Is featuring these in a different way, different size, different uh, part of the website, different fonts. Um, way they're embedded with video, you can embed it from YouTube, which is usually a bad move. You can use other tools like Wistia to serve up your videos for a number of different reasons that we won't get into here today. Uh, where should the phone number be? In this case, we're supposed to have it in sort of smaller text up in the top left. I showed you an example where it was large and on the right-hand side of the navigation. I don't know. You should try it. But ultimately, if you're just getting started with A-B testing, you're trying to create a culture of testing and build some momentum behind it, you know, I seldom advocate for doing things like color, uh, testing buttons, the size of the button, the color of the button or whatnot, because if people want what you have, they'll figure out where the button is and they know how to use the internet because it's 2018, almost 2019, if you can believe it. Um, so my, my theory is it doesn't really matter what color the button is because they'll figure out where the button is uh, if they really want your product. Um, and there's these bigger opportunities. But if it takes testing fonts and colors of buttons, to get you going and develop a culture of testing, and then by all means, start easy, make it fun, and get some, you know, build some momentum right behind it. Well, that's that's real good. And Tom has uh, one last question here, and it's a good one. It says, I understand A-B testing takes a lot of traffic to determine a winner. And he's saying that he has a small site with uh, not much traffic. So he's asking, is A-B testing still an option for me? Uh, it is. It's 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 more difficult because, uh, as as he pointed out, um, it does take a, quite a bit of traffic to to statistically prove, you know, without a reasonable doubt, that 
that the outcome is statistically accurate. So a lot of times it takes you know visitors to the tune of 100,000, 200,000 visitors to determine uh, the, a uh, decision on you know two different variations. Uh, more if you have two or three different variations that you're trying. Uh, but with a smaller business or a startup, typically what you want to do is uh, look for you know bigger gains. So for a big site, it's easy to test something and see that if it has a zero point. 0.01% improvement in conversions, that might still be something that benefits that large company. Um, but that's not going to help a startup very much is by increasing it one one hundredth of 1% uh, conversion is not really going to help that much. So you're looking to double your conversions or triple your conversions. If there's no sign of a test in the early stage, actually doubling or tripling your conversions, you can just abandon it and get back to either implement the one you like, uh, or uh, just roll it back to where it was and start from there. Um, so you're looking for bigger gains, and those can be identified earlier, you know, with A/B testing. And then, as a general rule of thumb, what I what I do is I tolerate uh, a lower percentage of confidence. So with every A/B test you use with the tools that I featured before, um, you can set your level of confidence. If you want to be 100% sure that your variation is the actual statistical winner then you have to go through the entire A-B test and test hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, but if you want to be just 80% confident, maybe you only need like 40 or 50,000 people depending on the polarity of the results. Uh, so what I like to do, especially for smaller sites, is just to tolerate a little bit more, uh, lower, a little bit lower confidence rating on those tests. And A-B testing purists do not uh, typically endorse that philosophy. Uh, but I think for smaller and medium businesses, it's okay to do that uh, as long as you understand that you may get some false positives out of that. And one out of every five tests may actually be a uh, a loser, even though it appeared to be a winner early stage in the, the testing cycle. Well, thank you, Bryce. This was very good. Remember, everybody who's registered will get a, a link to this video and also uh, take up, go to uh, Bryce's site and take up his offer for the free audit of your website. With that, guys, thank you very much and have a pleasant day. Merry Christmas to all.